sudah saya Usman Bakar Profesor John Esposito dan Sri Zulkifli duta-duta dan tetamu-tamu kehormat Uh, saya menganggap ini satu penghormatan luar biasa uh, oleh uh, kerana jemputan ini sebenarnya jemputan untuk mendengar kupasan <coughs> dan hujahan intelektual uh, dan saya ini uh, lebih dikenali sebagai uh, petugas politik biasa. Uh, Excellency, ladies and gentlemen, it's profound uh, pleasure on my part to express my gratitude to Osman and the team uh, in creating this new uh, or supporting this new found freedom to continue and exchange uh, reason discourse on issues which some of us even consider very contentious now this is of course relevant to our discourse tonight because without creative thinking without the essential freedom to articulate your views we cannot hope to achieve a meaningful societal reform. I just got back from Doha uh, together with Dabo Toglu and um, Rashid Ghanoussi as speakers at the a very, very important conference, 70 years of Marhum Malik Ben Nabi. Now, Malik Ben Nabi is not certainly a precursor, but a very profound figure that calls for societal reform, that express his utter disgust at the failure of Muslims to think freely and to interpret even the Quran in terms of its relevance to the society at present, and, 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 and during his time. He was uh, very involved in the initial struggle against the French, but he, was, he felt more appalled at the rate and understanding of Islam by the community, by essentially Islamic communities. Now, in his um, phenomenon of Al-Quran, he talked about memorizing the Quran, which is of course encouraged, but not understanding its uh, message and the call for Islam mastata, which is of course central to the Quranic message. In his um, Shurut and Nahda, Conditions for Renaissance, he of course talked about understanding a creative and reasoned discourse, which must be a precondition, which is essentially a mastery, not only of the language, but of knowledge. And of although he did not craft in the way that uh, T.S. Eliot talks about information, knowledge, and wisdom, certainly in his uh, Shurut and Nahda, uh, the conditions of Renaissance, he talks about the need for the Muslim society to engage and to have a profound understanding through knowledge, and educational reform. Now, some of us assume that educational reform can be achieved through efforts by intellectuals and educationists. They may be right, but they have never been proven right throughout history. Salahuddin al Ayyubi, for example, is known to be a, a fighter. Yes, a uh, 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 um, leader with such passion for justice and reform. But you must, uh, some of you follow the life of Salahuddin, who realized that for the first 10 years after he took over, remember, not before he took over, the reform can be initiated by a clear, definitive policy. And he then used mosques to alert the Muslims about the predicament, predicament and malice of the society by going back to the Quran, understanding Islam, but relating it to the plight of the modern man during his period. The malice of the Ummah because of their failure to appreciate the need to master knowledge. 
So to my contention, therefore, as Osman alluded to earlier, is to support this uh, effort by the present Pakatan Harapan government, for example. I have uh, asked uh, the Speaker in the House to support the setting up of a caucus on reform and governance in Parliament and hopefully the Senate that could oversee the need for societal reform. Because I don't believe that we can have effective education reform without the commitment, the political will to do that. Now, I would summarize the exhortations by Malik Ben Nabi when he talked about the need not only to acquire traditional Islamic knowledge, but modern disciplines, particularly during his period, psychology and sociology, because he is essentially a Khaldunian. He revised the uh, interpretation of Ibn Khaldun in many ways, because to him, the interpretation of the Quran must be to understand the text and the context. Now, you are familiar, of course, I mean, this is uh, essentially a gathering of intellectuals, uh, a good grasp of our own history and historical antecedents. But you would realize, therefore, that being a bit uh, nostalgic about the past is certainly no answer for the present. Understanding, yes, but we must also grapple with the problems of the present. Some of us are familiar with this uh, Harry, Mul Harry Miller's uh, education without a soul. I tend to be a bit cynical to some of them, how Muslim scholars react to this book. I'm sure Tansi Zulkifli is more familiar because he's at the helm of the university. We talk about Harvard, and nobody could question the standard of excellence in academic discipline in Harvard. Since I was at Georgetown, I would say similar to Georgetown. <clears throat> but Miller's contention as a former dean was that the failure of the educational enterprise at Harvard is not in terms of its excellence in terms of academic disciplines, but have created or allow the emergence of a new generation that is devoid of soul. It's a soulless society. They have university, they can articulate on all issues, but very little concern about the plight of the poor, the issue of discrimination against the blacks, outside the campus. I heard a comment from some of intellectuals here who says that at least in our universities, let me include the stack and IIU, we may not achieve academic excellence, but we have a soul. I'm not too sure whether we achieved that level of understanding, appreciation, and grasping soul as envisaged both in Miller's book or certainly in Islamic tradition and aims of education. I think it is better that we begin with some humility. Humility to accept there are serious challenges affecting us in terms of academic disciplines, in terms of quality of education, and not the debate which to me seems to be quite irrelevant in our present discourse. Of course, we have linguistic skills. In Malaysia, we are quite determined to ensure that there must be adequate mastery of the national language. But it's not a zero-sum game. Languages which include English or Arabic or French must be open for students to master, 
the more languages, the more profound the level of understanding and education. But the debate here seems to be quite a zero-sum game. If you master Malay, you must know English. If you talk about competency in English, then you are seen, some of us may be in that category, to be ignoring the importance of the national language. But to me, more challenging is the whole issue of academic excellence, the quality of education, which is a major challenge in our society. We do hear reports. I remember in 1961, Professor Diraja Nku Aziz tends to be very cynical against experts, uh, economic analysts, bankers, who tend to give somewhat uh, very impressive reports and accounts of our achievements. You just need to travel one hour away from Kuala Lumpur to see grinding poverty or gross inequality within Kap. Which oftentimes the experts in Kuala Lumpur, the economists, the analysts, which Rashid you are familiar with, seems to ignore. And I think this is of course a failure to grasp. And it's similar case of education. We cannot compare ourselves with the poorest societies and countries in the Muslim world. We have to acknowledge the fact that we still have a long way to go to achieve academic excellence and to ensure that our students are being trained in terms of discipline, character, which have clear relevance to the contention of what a soul or a soulless society should not be and a society with strong moral, ethical values and principles. So the, my question is therefore, is not whether it is Islamic or Western so much as to have a clear position on the need to excel and of course to attain the character and ethical moral values which is clearly a, 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 a clearly a principle that must be strongly embedded in Islamic ethics and religion. But this is of course for that's easy really to think about. I'm just giving a, a provoking some issues here. Uh, I'm, not, I'm not, of course, naturally suggesting that we are essentially in a hopeless state. But I do question some of us who seem to think, I mean, the more Western educated uh, political leaders or educationists would come and search for some report, some obscure finding to show how great we are and, and the, on the other side, the so-called Islamists would say that look, in our universities, particularly in this university, we have actually found the answer. I am very involved, I am very supportive all these years, although for the last 20 years I was not able to enter the university for reasons known to you, but my heart and soul is with the university. I'm still committed to the idea of education that must have, must not only focus on educational excellence in terms of academic excellence, but also in my character, ethical, moral values and principles. My fear is this attitude um, that, that seems to uh, be to me in a state of denial. If we truly understand the meaning of reform, the need to reform in this country, we should start by acknowledging that we are on such a low threshold, then the challenge should be more meaningful. We can compare ourselves to the poorest 
countries in Africa, and we can gloat about it. But certainly, I think the challenge is to compare with the best. Academic excellence, of course, in the top universities, in terms of moral ethical values, if we don't have them now, we look at the classical universities and institutions of the past. Now, um, I would end with a quote from Tocqueville. Uh, I hope it is not too contentious, as his text, so called more tolerant. I mean, after all, we are talking about multiculturalism. And uh, though I did not, but I leave it to the more structured lecture by Esposito, not only a clique, but uh, some of his books, including the Encyclopedia, was clearly my compendium when I was in the solitary confinement in the prison cell. So um, I at least can safely say that there is also some blessing to be whole and then thrown into the solitary confinement lockup because it's an excellent time where you can read as much as you can, as you want. Um, some of my colleagues, including Professor Kamal and the rest, uh, sent me books just now after dinner. I thought, oh, how wonderful it would have been if it, I could have received it last year. <laughs> then I would be able to uh, really, I mean, it's amazing. You can spend 10 hours a day reading books that happen, happen to be just your friend. I mean, you meditate, you read the Quran, you memorize verses of the Quran much more now than ever before. <laughs> but I think um, devouring books was a real wonderful and great pleasure. Um, gives you so much uh, solid satisfaction and uh, contain your sanity and avoid madness in prison. But Tocqueville talks about general societal uh, reform oh, and uh, looking at the, 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 the early period in the United States uh, history um, about the problem of education and society which must be addressed. This is uh, different from an elitist discourse. The stark reality is there is grinding poverty in the Ummah and in this country. The stark reality is there's a gross inequality from those who are given the opportunity to get the best of education and facilities and those we have no means to get good education. So this whole rhetoric and slogan of UNESCO about democratization, democratization of, of access to quality education is still certainly very far from its target. Tocqueville said the danger of society, including education, when he can clearly allow or move to create two classes, one small, the other many, separating each other, separating from each other. Now, some of us look purely in the statistical numbers between the rich and the poor. But the stark reality is when there is gross injustice, marginalization, neglect, then you will create within our societies one full of jealousy, defiance and hate, and the other with their heads in the clouds. I'm cautioning you so that elites and intellectuals in this country, in our society and the Ummah, will not create those with heads in the clouds.
this more relevant here in this country because when we saw such gigantic proportion of financial malfeasance and endemic corruption involving billions of dollars from public purse you find political leaders damned scat and you find elites and intellectuals all or mostly muted this led to a complete destruction of institutions of governance the judiciary the enforcement agencies corruption commission and of course political leadership let us learn from the lessons of history and by this societal reform and economic reform create a society that is not only knowledgeable and competent to address the problems of the present society including artificial intelligence digital revolution but also to ensure that there is justice and fairness for all assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh